I really want to thank, um, thank everybody for coming back for day two. Um, we've gone out on a little bit of a tangent today from what we normally hear about at sessions, and um, I'm going to stretch us even further. So um, thank you for coming back. And um, I want to say, um, first and foremost, that I'm speaking for a whole lot of people today. Um, and this is the Coles Notes version of, um, of the project. This is a large project. It has a lot of different aspects. And I'm only going to cover um, four little vignettes in the 30 minutes that I have, which probably stretch to more Newfoundland time, maybe 35 or 40 minutes. Um, but what I would like to do is encourage you to spend one more day with us on Monday to um, come to our workshop, um, which is going to be held um, just east of here in the Health Sciences Building, the new Health Sciences Building that has a big long name that I've forgotten. Um, but we've been calling it the Lego Building. You can't miss it. Um, it's direct opposite to the Butter Dome. And um, so you'll hear more about, in, and in greater detail, what I'm going to talk to you today about. So this is really an introduction. This is to whet your appetite. If you're here on Monday, that's great. You can also um, dial in and participate remotely if you if you can't make it to the Lego building. And if you'd like to do that, Matt Bryman over there will set you up. So please see him at the break. So I'm aware that I'm standing between you and coffee. So um, with that, let's move on. So I'm going to start with um, just a, a brief overview of this um, project, which has been off the ground since um, about 2007. Uh, we got fully started in 2008, um, and it's, as I mentioned, it's a large project with many aspects, most of which I'm, I'm not going to cover. Um, but what I am going to do is just briefly introduce you to the notion of genomics and how we're using genomics to address some of the practical issues um, that are encountered with mountain pine beetle. Um, first, focusing on how we're using genomics to address physiology of the tree and how the tree responds to mountain pine beetle attack. Um, and this will be a lead into the next talk that you'll have after coffee, where Maya's going to um, provide us with more detail on how the beetle then is responding to the changes that the tree puts forth uh, in response to um, both differences between species as well as um, different environmental um, factors. And I'm also going to touch briefly on um, two projects that we have in the lab. We're using population genomics approach to look at genetic variation on the landscape. Um, these, are, these are the teasers, because I'm not really going to touch too much on these today. Um, but on Monday, um, Barry will bookend our two sessions. The other cook, some would say I'm the new and approved cook. That's, that's the other one. We'll bookend the session to really um, uh, set the stage for why we thought genomics could make a difference in terms of practical applications like modeling and and show how that's uh, that we've incorporated data that we've already generated to date in the risk assessment process whether it's an active way um, through the risk assessment process say through the National Forest Pest Strategy or through the modeling exercises and also just a little tiny bit on how we think the data that we've generated could be incorporated into forest management strategies. So as I mentioned, this is a large multi-headed beast um, that involves collaborators from the University of Alberta, BC, Northern BC, and the Canadian Forest Service, where um, our anchors are physiological genomics and population genomics linking together um, with various different techniques, including biochemistry, chemical ecology, genomics resources, all sorts of branching out to connect multidisciplinary fashion to really address holistically the issue of this system of, of mountain pine beetle, the host that it attacks, and the fungi that it carries feeding into risk modeling. And we have two aspects to this risk modeling. We have the environmental risk modeling that you've heard about um, in several talks yesterday, also economic risk modeling. If you have the um, potential for mountain pine beetle to um, ravish a forest, what is the optimal use of trees within that area? What is um, the optimal allocation to solid wood products or 
pulp products or bioenergy products? Under what conditions would you maybe change the allocation of your wood products? Under what risk would you make that decision? Uh, is it under certitude that your that your stand is going to be attacked? Is it under threat that your stand is going to be attacked? Or is it under distant thought that your stand could be potentially attacked in the future? And so Grant Power has been doing um, a tremendous amount of modeling on that. He's not able to make it on Monday, but Barry will have his Coles notes to fill us in there. So this, as I keep mentioning, this is a really large project. Um, and these are all of the um, people who have done the heavy lifting over the project. Um, some of them, like Brad, may never really recover from their experience with the project. And it involves a number of um, co-investigators um, that range the span from, as I mentioned, Grant Howard as an economist, through to the modelers, through to um, molecular biologists. And if it wasn't for Matt and Karen, we'd seriously be off the rails by now. So genomics, what is genomics? We keep mentioning this word. Genomics is really just the science of looking at DNA. So we've got DNA in our chromosomes, and we can create maps of that DNA, and those maps can be made with genetic markers that could be positioned at certain intervals along that DNA, and at its finest resolution, we can have a whole genome sequence of all of the letters that make up all of that DNA. Sometimes, in the case of, say, for example, conifer genomes, which are horrendously large, we can concentrate just on the sequences of the genes that are expressed. So ignoring all the in-between sequences and just looking at the sequences of those genes that encode for proteins that are the business end of how the cells work. So um, in the early stages of the project, we developed these genomic resources. So we have gene sequence catalogs for the fungi. We have gene sequence catalogs for the beetle. We have gene sequence catalogs for the pines. And we haven't just concentrated on one individual as they started out, say, for the human genome sequencing project. But we've looked at, uh, as a measure of diversity, a whole suite of individuals from each of those so that we have an idea of what our range of variation is. Um, so now we've got whole genome sequences for um, a couple of the fungi that are associated with mountain pine beetle, but we also have a nearly complete genome sequence for mountain pine beetle, and that's, um, that's just about ready to go to publication, and, and most of that work has been done at the University of British Columbia. So genomics is really taking advantage of those, those sequences, those gene sequences, to look at many, many, many genes all at the same time, or many, many, many individuals all at the same time, or in the best situation, many, many, many individuals and many, many genes all at the same time. So we've heard about looking at this process or that process and wondering if this other process might be important. This particular technology of microarrays um, was developed as a way to open up the hood and, and ask the organism, what do you say is important? Rather than us inferring, well, based on other studies, we think this is important, this is a way to query all the genes all at the same time and say, you tell us what you think is important. So we can look at 25,000 genes simultaneously for pines using these. And this is, this is the same sort of technology that is being used, say, in personalized medicine, where if for example, if you've got breast cancer, the doctor may take a biopsy, they may run one of these microarrays and say, well, what kind of breast cancer do you have? And with that knowledge of what kind of breast cancer do you have, what is the best treatment prognosis? So this is using some of the latest technologies that are used in human medicine and in personalized medicine to bring to bear on the question of mountain pine beetle. As I mentioned, we can also survey many, many, many individuals all at the same time. Some of you might have um, dim and distant memories of, say, Bruce Danzig's lab with those great big slab gels and, and people with coffee grinders and, and um, staying up all hours of the day and night to load these lanes. And they would do that months and months and months on end. At the end, they might have a table of data. We can do that in an afternoon, and we can do many, many, many thousands of genes now. 
and many, many thousands of individuals. So it makes looking at populations, having that replication, being able to scan the landscape much more feasible than it used to be. So here's a, a map that you're all familiar with, the extent of the mountain pine beetle outbreak. And one of the first um, uh, technologies that we wanted to have in place were markers that could help us distinguish what lodgepole pine was, what jack pine was, and what hybrid pine were in this region. Because the question came up very early on, well, when will we know when mountain pine beetle gets to jack pine? Because those of you who are out in the field know that it is really hard sometimes, in many cases, particularly in um, these neighbor regions, to distinguish jack pine from the hybrids that may be side by each with it. And so um, through the hard work that Kathy has done, we developed um, genetic markers to um, distinguish jack pine from lodgepole pine and their hybrids. So here we see pure lodgepole pine, here we see pure jack pine, and everything that's got contributions from um, uh, both ancestors. And so working with ASRD, and in particular the um, Athabasca Forest Health Unit, we were able to um, use these genetic tools to say that samples that have been thought to have been jack pine, in fact, were jack pine. Several of those samples that have been thought to be jack pine ID'd out in the field turned out actually to be hybrids, but some of those turned out to be jack pine. And, and here in Alberta, that was important, but what was really important was the reaction east of here, in Ontario particularly, saying, wow, that's not just a a problem in BC, that's not just a problem in a species that doesn't reach us, this is a problem now in a species that we're intimately familiar with that's here. So what it did is take mountain pine beetle from being a regional problem of something way far away from, from Ottawa and made it a national problem. And we did that through, through the development of markers. So Kathy worked um, again with ASRD and Leonard Barnhart and his crew to, um, to survey um, a number of different trees then across this putative zone of hybridization into the um, putative um, pure jack pine zone and, and through this lodgepole pine zone. And we had samples um, above and beyond the samples that are shown here. And you can see that um, this classic notion of where the hybrid zone is doesn't actually encompass where we might find hybrids. And so um, through a modeling exercise, Kathy and, and Patrick James then were able to come up with a new rendition of what that hybrid zone looks like, overlaying that genetic data on the pine volume data to show where you might statistically um, expect to find hybrids within this northern Alberta region and where you would be confident in finding jack pine or confident in finding um, lodgepole pine. And so you can see that that map looks quite different than the classic little distributions from the U.S. Geologic Survey. They further went on and looked at what would be a predictor, accurate predictors or, or strong predictors of where you would find the high probability of jack pine versus the high probability of lodgepole pine. So good predictors of jack pine um, were moist climate moisture index, extreme minimum temperatures, and of course the easting longitude. <coughs> so lodgepole pine and jack pine, comes to no surprise to you on the ground, occupy different niches within northern Alberta. And the hybrids then are intermediate, but even within a same local region, we may find lodgepole pine up high on hills and jack pine down below. You can find hybrids in between. So it's not that their, their, re their regions are distinct, but they do occupy very different niches. And so Kathy's now getting a handle on, on what is maintaining that zone of hybridization, which can have um, fairly important implications if we're planning in the future for, for forest management. 
So at the end of the day, now that we know that uh, mountain pine beetle is on jack pine, we know that this zone of hybridization is um, well, um, has been um, infested now for a few years. Our next question really was, are there differences in the defenses that lodgepole pine presents to mountain pine beetle versus jack pine? So lodgepole pine being the co-evolved host, jack pine being a new host. And, and there has been recent data um, from um, staff in Lindgren and, and Alan Carroll saying even within lodgepole pine, we know that um, they see differences between lodgepole pine that come from areas that have historically seen attack versus um, what they call the naive pines, the lodgepole pines, that are in areas that we don't think have been subject to historical attack. So it stands to reason, as, as a, a good working model, that there may be differences between the defenses of lodgepole pine and jack pine. And so um, uh, this was a point that was brought up a couple of times yesterday, that when mountain pine beetle attack densities are high, it doesn't matter what the tree presents as a defense. It's going to get, what was the word? Swapped. Is that it? it yeah, it's, it's, it's done. It's done. But at the lower mountain pine beetle attack densities, that's where the tree defenses can make a difference. And we know from our time on the ground collecting mountain pine beetle in the early stages of the infestations here in Alberta that we could walk miles. We could drive snowmobiles miles into the bush. We could look for a, a long, long time. And, and there would be reports of beetles in the area, but that didn't matter because the beetles had mainly been pitched out. So trees do defend themselves. And it can make a difference, but it makes a difference only at these lower mountain pine beetle attack densities. And I should mention, these are the, the classic curves from uh, Ralph and Berryman. So this is the part of the curve that's affected by the genetics of the mountain pine beetle host, the pines, as well as the environment. And so there has been some work uh, that's been done in lodgepole pine looking at resistance. And this has been carried out mainly by Alvin Yanchuk using um, material in the Red Rock nurseries, um, some provenance trials. And mountain pine beetle, uh, resistance to mountain pine beetle initial attack is moderately heritable. So strongly heritable, it's moderately heritable. And given the pattern of heritability, it's very likely controlled by a whole bunch of genes, each with very, very small effects. So it's not like you're going to find the gene that's going to confer resistance. Resistance, then, is a multitude of genes, all contributing a very small proportion to this overall strategy that the tree presents as a defense against beetle attack. The environment as, um, as we know from classic ecological studies and more recent ecological studies also plays a role in that stressed trees, or the weaker trees, seem to be the favorite targets in those early stages of an infestation, at those lower attack densities. We heard about that yesterday. Whereas once the attack densities um, become higher, then those larger, more healthy trees, those, those popsicles that the beetles can really benefit from become the favorite targets. So the environment then, in, in, the, um, in the role of creating these chronically stressed trees, can play a role in this early part of an infestation when the mountain pine beetle attack densities are in that lower amount. So we're also looking at not only differences between the defense responses of lodgepole and jack pine, but also looking at environmental effects. And the we actually started out looking at two effects, the fertilization and climate moisture index or, or water availability um, through the process of um, focusing on what we could reasonably achieve within the time frame of the grant. We've um, focused almost exclusively on drought these last few years. And so um, what I'm going to do is show you a little bit about what the tree is presenting to the beetle. And this will be a segue to what Milo will present after coffee. And she'll talk about what the, what the beetle is perceiving from the tree. And she's got some awesome videos. I'm really looking forward to that. 
So what we've done then are um, growth chamber studies under controlled conditions with seedlings. We know that mountain pine beetle doesn't um, attack seedlings, so we've also um, taken genomics out into the field. Um, this is no trivial task, so we've done these experiments in hybrid stands, as well as lodgepole and jack pine out at the Smoky Lake Center. And um, in order, one of, one of the challenges when you're working at the molecular level is signal to noise. And so we have to do everything that we can to control variation so that we can tease apart what is the signal from, from the noise. And then once we know what that pattern is, when we can get the statistical significance, then we can go out and use those tools that, that we've determined um, are um, useful probes for a specific process. Then we can go out in a more natural environment and we can say, okay, let's take a look in a more um, a natural stand subjected to natural attack by mountain pine beetles. So this is a way to discover the processes that matter so that we can use those tools then in the next phase to look at more natural situations. So we've used um, inoculation with um, gross mania clavidra, which we've heard about as one of the mountain pine beetle fungal associates. And um, we've also done just a wound to compare what the fungal pathogen um, is doing in terms of eliciting a tree response versus just the wound alone. This is a factorial experiment with well watered or water deficit conditions and I should mention that we've used a fairly mild degree of water deficit, one that would be encountered in a natural stand situation with our species lodgepole pine, jet pine, and hybrids. <coughs> 